Welcome to Rick Drayson Live. I'm your host, Rick Drayson, and I've had a, a maraud of guests on this show from all types of oh, occupations in life, and it makes it really interesting to talk about their life with fitness and nutrition. And so I've tried to like expand as much as I can. I brought in a friend of mine who's a very, very well-known actor and a writer, and he's been on many, many shows, Civil War, Sex in the City, uh, Goodfellas, just to name a few. And I'm very happy to have with my side here is Peter Onorati. Hello, Peter. Rick. This is our third show we've done together, yep. by the way. And, and, and we're still doing it. And we're still doing it. And I just want to start off a little bit about you grew up on the East Coast and you got into something completely different than entertainment at the time, right? Yeah, I was, uh, you know, uh, I had my MBA. I was in advertising and publishing my last job before yeah. I became an actor. And, um, you know, I started off, uh, well, basically uh, out of college yeah. in the business world. But I, I, one of the reasons I ended up in the business world was because... I didn't get to play pro football. <laughs> so um, that was my first love. That was yeah. the thing I wanted to do. And uh, I got cut, so. I you did, you didn't try else. again after that? No, because when I got cut, I got cut from the World Football League. And it was, uh, the timing was such that I had already missed the NFL by then. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, my father had my shovel and my wheelbarrow ready. So he said, come to work for me till you use your degree. <laughs> All right, so, you know, that's a whole different game than entertainment. entertainment when you come from a family and the family expects you to go to college and become something great and then you say no I'm gonna become an actor just like I became a wrestler they all looked at me and they probably look at you like why would you want to join the circus you know because <laughs> with me it was the circus back then yeah. but how'd your family feel about that well I waited till my parents were in Florida yeah. uh, to tell them that <laughs> all the time I had spent getting my MBA in 12 years in the business world was now gonna go south and I was gonna try acting yeah but um, they handled it okay from a distance and you know, I was living by myself and I had a certain amount of money and, and, uh, and I put a certain amount aside and I said, okay, when this runs out, if I'm not an actor, then I'm not an actor. Yeah. Did you give it a time frame? Uh, it was more the money. Well, the money has a time frame. Well, I guess, you know, back then that would be about uh, a year. Okay. That's, you know, in, in most cases, that's not enough. No, I was very lucky. But you know what happened was, and this will have, this, we may bring this up later too. When I got into acting, the stereotypes that were very popular then, this was in 1987, yeah. uh, were uh, Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, yeah. Tony Danza. Yeah, I know where you're going. And Bruce Willis. Yes, that's all of you. <laughs> you know? So it w and, and that's what they were using to cast commercials and, yeah. and things like that. So that's what I did. I first, since I had no acting training, except for I was working uh, with an improvisational comedy group in New York City for about five years before that. And uh, just having fun in all the holes in a wall in, in New York and, and, and entertaining doing improv. Um, since so I had no real acting training except for that improvisation. I went and got a crash course in commercials from a guy and within two weeks I was on hold for a national beer commercial mm -hmm. because those are the types of guys they were looking for. And right? those were the days they did that. Yeah. And a national job back then was a lot of money. You could make a living off of one or two national yes. jobs. Yes. You know? Not like today. No. No, you, as a matter of fact, within a year and a half, I was making more than I was making as an advertising and publishing executive. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. But there's also a combination here with you with De Niro and Stallone. Yeah. We, I have, we just know. saw the, the grudge match. Oh, yeah, I want to see that. I can see you in there. <laughs> I want to play De Niro's brother someday. I can see you in there. Definitely yeah. see you yeah. in there. You ever see my De Niro face? Let's see it. That's it. See? You're him. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I developed that when I was, when I was doing uh, Goodfellas. We were sitting in the back of the car. Right. And De Niro gets in. It's 3 o'clock in the morning in Brooklyn. And he gets in. He goes, how you doing? I'm Bobby De Niro. I go, I know. He goes, <laughs> so he kept doing that the whole time. How was he to work with? He's great. I mean, he was great. You know, he and every, after every damn shot, he would get up and walk over to Scorsese, and the two of them would be talking. They'd be laughing like this, and they'd come back with something different to do. You know? Yeah, that's a real treat working with somebody like that. It was very cool for me. I'm you sure. Know, when he said, "I'm Bobby De Niro," I said, "I know. I know who you are." Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, really? I just thought you were Kirk Douglas. <laughs> um, you've had a lot of really good roles over the years. Yeah. I mean, you keep get landing good shows. Yeah, I have. I mean, you know, I started out, my first job, my first serious job in television was the last season on a show called Kate and Alley, mm -hmm. which was a sitcom. And again, my improv comedy background, you know, gave me, you know, some sort of comfort zone 
to go into something like that as a first job. Right. When I came out to California, uh, uh, my wife and I were pregnant. And my son was born out here. All my boys were born out here. Um, I worked. I started working for Stephen Botchko, and that he's pretty much the one who made me a, a leading man type. Yeah, he was a very successful man. Yeah. Now we have a picture. Uh, can we bring up the um, role of the wrestler in Sex in the City? Uh oh. There it is, with Kim Cattrall. I remember telling you a year ago or so. I, I I saw something and I kept bringing it up. But you get hit about this all the time. Yeah. This is probably, you've done major roles, but probably this is the most one you get talked about, right? Well, it's the most amount of exposure I think <laughs> you'll ever see. And, and <laughs> tell, I, know you, I know how this came about, but tell us how it came about. Uh, the producer um, at the time, Michael Patrick King, uh, had known me for a long time and also knew me from my improv days. He was a stand-up comic back in New York and a performance artist. And he called me and said, uh, I'd just like to do five sex scenes with Kim Cattrall. And I said, nah. I'm going to wash my hair. So I said, of course. Of you, course know, right. uh, you fly me out to New York. I'm not going to pay for it. You know, I, know I haven't paid for sex lately. Yeah. So, you know, and they flew me out. We had a great time. And actually, it was right on my birthday. Um, and it was funny because uh, we were just about to do the last scene. And the director was picking all these sort of positions off a sheet of paper. But I had wrestled in high school and college, so Michael thought, you know, you just tell them what you want to sure, do. Sure, but you know, you know where to go with it. So um, Kim said to me, uh, she said, uh, geez, thanks for doing this. She goes, it's so great to be working with an actor. She goes, some of the guys they bring in here sometimes. Are... I said, listen, Kim, it's my birthday, and I can't think of anything better to do than to bang you five times on my birthday. <laughs> you get paid for it. <laughs> she says, it's your birthday? I said, yeah. And I don't want to hear any crap about it, but I'm, I'm telling you now. So it was the last scene. I went back to the dressing room. I put my clothes on. I went to my car. And within that amount of time, she had sent a PA. He comes running down the street uh, in Queens with a Carvel ice cream birthday cake for oh, me. Oh, nice. So she was a sweetheart. Oh, yeah, that's nice. You know? Well, this brings me to this, because um, in acting and in sports and all that, everybody's physique plays a certain role. And back in the days of the 70s, and I had, I'd gotten into the acting as well, and I was a bodybuilder, it actually kind of hindered me because they had me always going to be the tough guy, the guy by the door, and this and that. You know, you're too big, you're too big, you're too big. And I know you hear this too. But how did this play in, in your role? How did the physique work in for you? I think because my physique has always been part of the whole and hasn't been as developed as yours and I had come from the culture that you came from I yeah. mean I aspired to that at times I know, you know? I know uh, but but I, I think as part of the whole it helped me to get my career started it has been a problem at times when people say oh he's too big because I just come off of playing a bad guy role where I'm chasing somebody through the desert with tattoos on my chest right. and you see that I have an athletic body yeah but what they don't think of is that, you know, you put me in a man tailor shirt, and I just kind of look like a fit guy. And if you give me a shirt that's two sizes too big, I'll look wimpy. You know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but, but, but there's how many actors are there out there who already are wimpy <laughs> that have yeah. this color hair and everything else. So that's, that's part of the problem, too. But the physicality, I, I tell you, the funniest thing for me crossing over into acting was it was the first time in my life that I trained my mind and my emotions in the same way that I had been training my body mm -hmm. all those years. Mm -hmm. So it was the discipline that I gained through bodybuilding and sports, especially wrestling, cutting weight and doing all that sure. stuff. Um, I, I started to apply those principles to building my emotional character uh, or, or um, or a history, a character history in a life. It just, the whole idea of, of, of discipline enough to take yourself out of who you are and put yourself into some other situation right. was something I had learned from the physical point of view, but never from the emotional or spiritual point That's of view. That's because bodybuilding does take discipline. I mean, you've got to yeah. train every day, you've got to eat a certain way, and, and you know what's right and what's wrong, yeah. and many people don't have that. So when you have discipline and structure, even like Schwarzenegger had discipline in bodybuilding, right. he used it towards acting and becoming a governor. I mean, he had his mindset, discipline's gonna put me where I wanna go. I have to tell you, uh, there, I, I learned a lot, of, a lot of discipline from coaches and, and teachers who now probably would be arrested if they did the things to us, to, did things to kids today that they did to us in high school. Yeah. I had coaches putting a nail in a kid's sandwich and you know, oh my God. tell the kid, you gotta be tough as nails after he'd been at the, uh -huh. 
Here's the thing about Thought maybe all he these, needed more iron. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing about all these psychos that we had as teachers and coaches who would be arrested and put into jail today. They taught us one thing, and it's something that's really helped me as an actor because it helped me first as a bodybuilder or, or, or as a physically driven person. They taught me how to go past my perceived limits. That I thought I could do this, but in reality, with the right or wrong kind of pushing, I could go to here. It's too politically incorrect to do that with anybody today, especially kids in a school environment or in sure. a, a sports environment. Sure. But there was a great value to that. And all these guys were, were Marines. They were, you know, just out of Paris Island or wherever. So they created Paris Island right there on the football field, you yeah. know? And again, it was, it was, man, you, I actually had a coach come up to me. We have a football reunion before Thanksgiving at this bar in New Jersey where, in the town where I grew up. And the coach came up to me and said, boy, I'd be in jail today if I did today what I did to you guys. I go, yeah, you would. Oh, there's no question about it. There's no question about it. You know? What got you interested in, in lifting and staying in shape? I mean, it takes, like you say, discipline. And I know I read magazines and I want to become those guys and I became those guys, but not everybody can. Right. But you had a definite interest in it. I honestly, I hate to say it, it was like the back of uh, the magazine. You know, I was always a small kid. Yeah. Getting pushed around. When I got kicked out of Catholic school and I went literally down the hill one block to public school, I got the crap beat out of me by all the public school kids because I was a Catholic school kid. Right, right. I was like fifth grade, you know? So along the way there, I started, oh, if I do some push-ups here, so at least I can defend myself. Sure. And then, uh, you know, my father bought me a 110-pound weight set. I put it in the cellar with a radio and eighth That's grade. That's funny because they were literally 110 pounds. 110. It wasn't 100 pounds, or 100, nope. it was 110. <laughs> yep, 110 uh -huh. pounds. I don't know why the extra 10, but. And, you know, and so, you know, I realized I was actually lucky enough to see. Plus, I worked in construction with my father when I was a kid from age 10 all the way through. So my body started to build up automatically and, and the weights accentuated it. And, you know, when you get reinforcement from some young girl or yeah. a buddy that says, what are you doing? You know, uh, I just felt like that's what I wanted to hear for a long time. I always ask you that. You know? I always tell you you're ripped. You know? um, how does your eating plan work for you? What do you, what do you eat as far as diet? I have, I, 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 you know, I, I don't have a particular plan. Uh, I haven't eaten beef in probably 25 or so years. Really? No right? meat? No meat. Um, uh, chicken, fish. Yeah. Um, uh, salad every day for lunch, a little turkey on it. Uh, Is it would this be Sharkies? Sometimes. Yeah, okay. Sharkies, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, very little starch now. Uh, I did, I did the zone diet one time when I was on a movie, uh, and I actually felt adding the fats back, you know, measured, worked. It worked for me. If you have a certain amount of chicken and fish is perfect. If you yeah. add the fats, you use that as energy. You don't store it as fat. Right. So you're dropping the carbs, you end up losing body fat. Right. And so how many days a week do you work out now? I work out six days a week, only four on the weights. Right. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Wednesday is all cardio. Yeah. Uh, it's just 30 minutes running. Or, yeah. And uh, and now, I, since I've, I've got a show coming up, I added Saturday mornings. I, I run uh, another two miles in intervals, you know, speed up the uh, treadmill and so on. As you get older, do you find it more difficult to train or hold muscle mass? I, I find it more difficult to hold muscle mass. Yeah. Uh, uh, because if I try to do what I did before, I get hurt. <laughs> I yeah. could hold it, but I would get hurt, you know? And, and, uh, I don't find it more difficult to train because now it's more habitual than ever. It's always habitual. If, if I don't go, I mean, my, it really, I, mind tricks just yeah. start to and, and you know flow. what? It doesn't take the heavy weight anymore. No. You can do it with a moderate, moderate weight to a light no. weight. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not training for football anymore. I don't need the extra bulk to beat somebody up or to yeah. run through somebody. I, it doesn't help me as an actor to be too big. Exactly. You know, so it's, it's great. It's actually the way it's evolved for me has been great. Okay, uh, we have to wrap this up, but I have a oh. question. Okay. If you were going to give someone a tip, somebody in the acting business today in the, in the entertainment business about training, would you uh, advise them to, to go to a gym and get in shape? Is it going to help them with their roles? I think, yes. I think if acting is being in tone with your body, right? It, using your body to create something else. The closer you are to that, by virtue of training and knowing yourself, absolutely, that training is, is 
crucial for me as an actor. Right. And I think it would help anybody. I do too. Well, you guys heard it from the horse's mouth. And this guy is very successful. Look at the body on him. He's built great. Yeah. He could have, he could have been a bodybuilder <laughs> very, very easily. And uh, I've always looked up to Peter. He's a wonderful guy and had a great career, a great actor. And I really want to thank you for being here. Thanks for I having me. Your, your, uh, your expertise is invaluable to me. And thank you for watching Rick Grayson Live. We'll be here next Friday at 1230, same time, same station. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Rick Grayson. For tips on health and nutrition and fitness and bodybuilding and wrestling and all the stuff you want to know, subscribe to me on EmpowerMe.tv. I'm on every Friday at 12.30 p.m. I'm looking forward to meeting you. And stay healthy.